Today we are doing a very serious and important show. And we call it the exit strategy. Now, unfortunately, nobody ever has lived forever. And at the end, I think it makes so much sense to be the person yourself to make the decision how you want to exit. And to help us with this, I have my wonderful geriatric doctor, Dr. Amanda Burling, she will help us. She will also talk about what her job or profession means and she will guide us with this document, which is called the MOLES document. Now, Dr. Amanda Burling works at the Quimby Center for Geriatric Care, which is a wonderful resource for us at the Mount Auburn Hospital in Cambridge. Now, I would let her talk about the next thing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me on today. Um, I really welcome this opportunity to speak with you and your listeners about this topic. Um, I think that uh, perhaps I should start by explaining a little bit about what a geriatrician is. Yes, a lot of people really don't know what mm -hmm. that means. Mm -hmm. So a geriatrician is an internal medicine doctor, so an, a doctor who cares for adults. But in particular, we have special training in working with older adults. So, which is very important mm -hmm. because a young person me needs are very different from mm -hmm. a really old old person. Mm -hmm. That's right. So we have um, sort of expertise in dealing with conditions that may be very common in older adults, like mm -hmm. falls or decline in one's function, um, cognitive impairment, and um, certainly dealing with things like advanced care planning, like we will be discussing today. Very important. Please pay attention. Yes. Um, so, uh, so a geriatrician sort of um, is a little bit different than the perspective of an internal medicine doctor, um, and I think that it can be helpful for older adults who have a lot of medical issues um, or a lot of medicines or have had a decline in their day-to-day -day function to seek care from a geriatrician when possible. I certainly think that's very, very important. The only trouble is it's hard to get you guys. Mm -hmm. There are too mm -hmm. many old people now. We need more yes. of you. Yes. Well, I, I certainly wish more of my colleagues, um, you know, shared the same interests. But um, fortunately, we've been able to connect. And the Mount Auburn. I was Auburn, very lucky. Yes, and Mount Auburn and some of the other hospitals in the area do have geriatricians who are available to see patients if needed. I so. hope so. It's not easy. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Now tell us, please, about what we should do to keep ourselves healthy mm -hmm. as long mm -hmm. as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. well, I think one of the things that geriatricians often like to focus on is um, sort of improving or maintaining the quality of life for their patients. And so um, sort of thinking about ways to um, focus on an individual's goals of care and thinking about ways to keep them healthy and in the community, um, living in, uh, you know, symptom-free for as long as possible is really our main goal. Uh, so to that end, um, a lot of the things that we focus on are making sure that you have routine medical care. Um, oftentimes, geriatricians see their patients more often than regular internists would. And they also see us longer, mm -hmm. not 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So we have a Quite little... a bit longer. That's right. We have a little more time to focus on some of yes, those issues. Very important. Yeah. So seeking routine medical care. Um, and then also, I think that just um, one of the next most important things is to uh, stay physically active when possible. Not so easy. Yeah, exactly. I don't do my exercises <laughs> too faithfully, yeah. unfortunately. Um, so, so as much as you're able sort of to get physical activity, um, it can be really important in maintaining your function and your level of independence as you get older. So sort of a good rule of thumb would be something like 150 minutes of exercise in a week, which would work out to something like 30 minutes five days a week for exercise. Um, I know it's easier said than done, but really any exercise is sort of better than not at all. 
Um, Walking is good, but I hate to walk. Yeah. So really what I tell my patients is that any physical activity that you'd like to be doing, um, I would I would accept, right? So it, it's not um, it, um, appropriate for me to tell you to start jogging if you would hate jogging or swimming if you really can't find yourself doing that. So really whatever it is that you like, whether or not it be swimming or walking, doing heavy gardening, um, a, a stationary bike, all of those things would be really good forms of exercise for older adults. But we got to do it. Mm -hmm. That's right. So having that motivation can be hard, but sometimes once you get started, it's not so difficult. <laughs> it's hard for me. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, I think that um, maintaining uh, a lot of social relationships can be really important. So I do find sometimes older adults can become a little bit isolated. And we know that um, sort of having that cognitive stimulation of being around others and having that ability to socialize with others is really important for your brain health and your mental health as well. Very important. You don't want to be a hermit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So sometimes folks find that it, combining some of those activities can be important. For example, maybe joining a book club where you can get cognitive stimulation and socialize at the same time, or going to your local senior center where you could do an exercise well, class. We have a very good one. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know that Belmont's senior center is yeah. very well regarded. Yeah. Um, so if, it, if it's possible to sort of do a combination of those things, that, that really could be helpful. And then beyond that, I would say being careful about um, your diet. So eating sort of a diet that's um, low in saturated fats, uh, has lean sources of protein like fish or chicken, beans or other legumes, and lots of fresh fruits and vegetables is also really important. So. That's a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> But, well, I'm a microwave, which I think is healthy anyway, mm -hmm. but it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, it can be hard, but it, the more um, you try to do those things, the better. Even if yeah. you can't follow a completely healthy diet, um, even making some sort of minor changes in your diet can sometimes have a big effect. Um, yeah, so those are really some of the things that we, we like to think about, about to stay healthy as you get older. Yes. We try. Mm -hmm. our, we should try our best. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Um. So now we will to be to our main subject, which is a little tough. Mm -hmm. What to do when you near your exit? And as I said, I always think it's best that you yourself make mm -hmm. the decision. Mm -hmm. And we will try to tell you how this document works. Mm -hmm. But you might want to discuss before you should be very, very careful when you sign this. You might want to discuss it with your doctor and your relatives and be very thoughtful how you do it. Mm -hmm. And now Dr. Burling will tell us a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about it. It can be hard. Uh, you know, it's a topic, thinking about your care at the end of life can be difficult to even sort of wrap your mind around. Um, on the other hand, I think that um, it can be very empowering for individuals to have you the opportunity. make the decision. Exactly. So I always tell my patients that um, I really would rather not guess what kind of care you would want at the end of your life. I'd really... Um, like the um, opportunity to hear from you what's important um, if you knew that your health was um, um, very poor. So to that end, there are sort of two types of documents that we often think about uh, when we think about advanced care planning or um, dealing with your wishes um, in the sense of a medical emergency. And one of those is something that many of um, your listeners would probably have heard of called a health care proxy. Yes. Um, and I think you're familiar with that yes, document, I have, right? Yeah, I have yeah. one, but I thought it's better if I make the decision. That's right. So that we sort of um, think about the two things. We think about if there was a reason that you couldn't make decisions on your own, 
who could your um, medical team enlist to help make those decisions? And that's called the healthcare proxy. And I'll just talk about that briefly because I think that's a little more straightforward than that most form we, yeah, we yes. want to spend the majority of our time discussing. Um, so the healthcare proxy is really someone that you know and you trust and you have confidence that this individual could follow your wishes if your health was um, uh, very poor. So as long as I have patients who are um, awake and alert and have their mental faculties about them, of course I will be asking that individual what they want. But in an instance where an individual is either very, very confused or not awake or alert, um, I often am relying on the healthcare proxy to make those decisions. Yes. But there is a way to do it yourself before you're out of exactly. it. Exactly. So and both, this is what the most. That's right. So both of these things are important, and the healthcare proxy should be done. But I would absolutely encourage all of your listeners to fill out what's called the MOLST form. So this stands for Massachusetts Order for Life Sustaining Treatment. Um, and each state has its own version of this form. Oh, I didn't but know that. Yeah. That's right. Um, so it wouldn't always be called MOLS, but in the state of Massachusetts, that's the acronym. And it comes in a, a pink, bright pink paper, so it can be easily identified. Right. And I w it, it's often something that's sort of hard to talk about and hard to think about. Yes, it's a little gory, but we'd have to do it. That's right. And so um, taking time to sit down with your doctor to review what the items mean, I think is really important. So I'd like to maybe take a minute to kind of talk about what, you, um, what the questions are on the form. Yes, if that's please. okay. So the first sort of set of questions is about if you have a emergency with your heart. Um, whether or not you would want to have CPR done. So for example, if your heart stops or if you have a very, very dangerous or fast heart rhythm, um, you can indicate on this form if you want to be resuscitated with um, things like uh, chest compressions or shocking your heart with electricity. Um, and again, this wouldn't come into place unless you were in sort of a very dire situation. The next question, set of questions is really about breathing problems. So the heart and the lungs often go together. Yes. Both of those are necessary to be functioning, to, uh, to be living. And so if you had a terrible respiratory problem where you couldn't breathe on your own, you could indicate on this document if you wanted to have a breathing tube in your throat and be put on a breathing machine, or if you wanted a mask of oxygen that goes on the outside of the mouth and nose that sort of pushes air into your airway. So both of those machines, uh, both of those choices sort of rely on a machine to keep you alive. Um, but with the second choice, there's no tube inside your body. And what I often say to folks is that I wish I could have a crystal ball. If I have a patient who um, has a really serious health um, uh, matter, I wish I could look into the future and say, this individual um, will come out of this fine or unfortunately will have um, a very, very um, significant decline in their level of function. But I don't have that ability, right? And so sort of it makes it hard to fill out these documents without knowing what the eventual outcome will be. But I urge folks to take their best guess if as to whether or not sort of the length of their life is most important, or if they know that their health is very, very poor, would they rather focus on sort of letting nature take its course? Well, I think this is a big question. Mm -hmm. I do want to live as long as I can, as long as I'm functioning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I'm a vegetable, forget it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do not want to be lying there like a vegetable and of course <laughs> the community so much. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if there is hope, I would want to go on. Mm -hmm. But if there is no hope, forget it. Mm -hmm. And what I say to my patients is that that um, reaction that you have is very normal. Um, unfortunately, I don't always have the ability to tell that at the beginning of an acute medical event. But on this MOLST form, on the back page of this document, there is a way to indicate that you want those breathing measures done short term. So That's right. Yeah. Short term makes sense in my opinion, mm -hmm. but you have to make the decision. 
That's right. So I have some patients who say to me, I want to live as long as possible, no matter the cost. Not in my case. Yeah. If I'm a vegetable, what's the sense? Mm -hmm. And then doesn't I, make any sense. That's right. And then I have other patients who say, I don't want anything that's invasive. And I have a lot of people like what it sounds like you've mentioned, which is sort of that middle category. Right. That's We're, what I think. But mm -hmm. as I said, we don't want to tell you what you should do. You have to decide. Exactly. You should discuss it with your relatives and your doctor. But we will tell you what there is. Exactly. And I think that's such an important point. Oftentimes these decisions are difficult and they require a lot of thought yes. and a lot of you careful discussion. You should be discussion. very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Don't just sign it. Mm -hmm. Think about mm -hmm. it. Um, and the, the document also has a few other items. Um, for example, there's an ability to say that you want to go to the hospital if you yes, have a medical I, emergency. I would certainly think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think most patients do, most um, individuals in my practice do say that they want to go to the yes. hospital. Um, I have a few individuals who may have very, very serious and terminal health issues that elect to stay home, say, under the yes, care of something I like hospice. I can understand that, mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. If they have somebody who cares for them, certainly they would might be a choice. That's right, that's right. And then there are also a few other questions um, that I just want to spend a little bit of time on. I think those ones I mentioned before are probably the most critical, but there is a way to indicate on this form if you would want dialysis if your kidneys failed. There's a way to indicate if you would want a feeding tube if you couldn't swallow on your own properly. And there's a way to indicate if you would want IV fluids, intravenous fluids, if you got very dehydrated. I certainly would. That's not the problem, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then another thing that I often have um, uh, individuals in my practice and their families ask about is, so if I sign this now and my health changes, can you I... You can change it. Exactly, exactly. So. Um, I think that's a really important point here that nothing on this form is written in stone. Um, I say to um, individuals I work with that this isn't our forever plan, this is our for now plan. Yes. And if something changes about your health... You or, can change it. Exactly. It's so we, very important. That's right. So I would not um, get concerned about completing it because it would be something that you think could change as yes. your health declined down the road. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something else which is I do want to bring up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we old people should contribute something. It depends. Maybe your religion will prohibit it. Mm -hmm. But I think we should think of donating our body to science mm -hmm. because it might help mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, if you burn it up, we just add to global warming. Mm -hmm. I think it's better if we donate it for research. But I know that's a little difficult. Now, I let the doctor tell us what we should and how we can do that. Yeah, I think that would be a wonderful gift uh, for any of the listeners today to donate their body to science. Um, in particular, as someone who's gone through medical school, I can attest that learning... It's helpful. It, it was definitely helpful. Um, really, all medical st students um, in many other professions like um, uh, perhaps nurse practitioners or dentists, um, oral surgeons, uh, really need to learn about the anatomy of the human body. And so that can be so helpful for us to get to know um, how to best take care of patients by understanding sort of the basics of how the body works. Uh, logistically, um, I would encourage uh, anyone who's interested in this to consider reaching out to one of their local medical schools, or even if there's a medical school that they have some um, you know, interest in having associated with or have some connection to, uh, that that would really be the way to go. And often um, uh, this information can even be available online. Mm -hmm. um, but making a phone call to the local medical school would be the way to set up sort of the logistics between yeah. the funeral home and your family and also the um, anatomic donation. 
I, I want to just also touch on the fact that um, organ donation could be something that could be useful for individuals as well. So there are certain medical conditions that would preclude you from donating well, the, your organs. At old age, they really want the organs. Sometimes. So, really? So I didn't I, know that. Yeah, so I do think it's something important to consider. And one other thing that, um, you know, again, I appreciate these are challenging topics to think about, but even having an, uh, um, even allowing for an autopsy of your body um, after you've passed can be helpful actually for the pathologist to learn more about certain diseases and that information can be used potentially for other um, individuals mm -hmm. in the same situation down the road. So um, oftentimes I have patients decline an autopsy which is, you know, a totally fine and completely fair, but um, if that's something you're sort of on the fence about, that information could be helpful for, for scientific purposes as well. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know. Yeah, it would help. Mm -hmm. Well, I mm -hmm. think you have to make your own decision on mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. But mine is they should learn something. <laughs> that's the least I can do. That's right. And, and actually, um, thinking about sort of learning from, from medicine, um, you know, there's certainly also some schools that would um, enroll older adults in um, medical research studies. So even as a living older adult, um, there's a lot to be learned about certain conditions. And, um, you know, that would be something to consider asking your doctor about if you were interested in getting involved with medical research. Yeah. We should help. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's important. Yeah. We yeah. want to learn more and more. <laughs> Maybe we we'll live longer and better then. Mm -hmm. And if we can contribute, we certainly should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's an important goal. We will try. Yes. <laughs> we will try. And I want you to understand that this is a very, very important program. Please. Pay attention, because when it's too late, it's too late. And you don't want other people to make your decisions. Please, pay attention and make your own decisions when you can. Because when it's too late, you can't do it. I hope you realize that. Well, I hope you watch this program and watch my wonderful doctor. And you know we are very lucky that we have the Mount Auburn Hospital, which is actually a Harvard teaching hospital. And then there's this very good program that the doctor practices in. And they took very good care of me. And now I have to look and see to, uh, to, to identify it properly. It's the Quimby Center for Geriatric Care, which takes very good care of old people. And I'm so grateful that the doctor came. I hope you will pay attention. It's important. Please. All right. Yeah. I think this is all we have to say right now. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate this opportunity. Well, I'm very happy to have you.